Uh, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction, Rhys, and uh, you know, congratulations to those of you who are graduating today. This is the beginning of a huge, big adventure, and uh, well, good luck this afternoon. I'm one of those really lucky people uh, who actually loves what I do, and I have always dreamt of doing the job I have now. So um, I hope that you know where you end up in the careers that you progress with, that you end up with the same sort of lucky fortunes that I have. Um, as Rhys says, I have travelled many countries around the world, and I was sitting with a colleague the other day, and we sort of went through our passports. I think I've notched up 49 countries, um, of which 28 we have current projects now with FFI. So today I'm going to talk about uh, taming the hydra, these new paradigms of the governance, as Rhys said, um, about how we can try and tackle the, the issues that are facing us in the conservation of nature. I'm going to take you through um, some definitions. I've, this is my first time I've done a Prezi, so um, enjoy. <laughs> um, but I thought I'd just explain to you some part of the concept of this whole sort of hydra thing. And you may be aware that the Linnaean hydra is this Greek mythological creature which Hercules had to try and defeat. And of course, every time he cut a head off, two more would grow back. And he had to find a strategy with the help of his nephew to conquer this creature. So it's a common body, so common issue, common body with multiple heads. And these multiple heads are, you know, these real big challenges. There's also this other hydra, which is a freshwater creature. It's a very small polyp. It's like related to a jellyfish, um, but it has infinite life. It breeds asexually, so it just reproduces itself, um, but it needs very specific environmental conditions. So it's a very fragile organism requiring very specific conditions. And I just thought it was quite a nice analogy, really, that we had these two definitions, um, but I'm going to focus on the mythological creature today. Just to get us all on the same page, um, I thought it would be useful to understand some of the definitions of these words that are going to come up um, numerous times through this, this afternoon's lecture. Um, biodiversity, um, and I, you know, just to give just an additional thing, I, I have been also working in international development for a long time, and sometimes these sorts of def definitions get lost on people who aren't biologists who don't understand ecology. But biodiversity is essentially the fundamental stuff of life. It's the very small genetic components of a species and those species that form congregations. It's the habitats those species live in and the ecosystems that kind of need to function in order for, the, for them to thrive. Ecosystem services are the benefits that we as human beings derive from biodiversity. So I always see biodiversity as one of the sort of fundamental underlying platforms which uh, help natural systems essentially give stuff to, to humans um, for, for our, our um, survival. Now we're very dependent on biodiversity and these uh, ecosystem services, for example, would be uh, soil provisioning, pollination for the fruit of the wines that grow, grow around the world, you know, whatever you might think, for, for pollinating um, plants. Um, we have storm and, and flood regulation, we have food provisioning, energy provisioning, climate regulation, all of these things cluster under this big term ecosystem services. So there are these enormous dependencies and of course we're having massive impacts. Rhys mentioned that Fauna and Flora International is 110 years old and that's a very long time. You know, we've been trying to work to reverse these sorts of trends in terms of the impacts on biodiversity. And we haven't quite got it right yet, which is why you know, we really do need to kind of move into these new paradigms to, to tackle it on. But there are also all sorts of risks and opportunities. There are risks to, to companies, there are risks to human beings if we start to damage these ecosystems beyond the tipping point where the function and the integrity start to decline to a point where they don't work anymore. And those ecosystem services that we're benefiting from are lost. But there are also opportunities and it's really essential that we kind of keep an optimistic view on this because I'm gonna show you a few rather hectic um, slides just to talk about some of the decline and the, and the sort of um, trends that we've been experiencing over the last 50 years. Um, 
you know, more than 60% of species are in decline. 80% of the world's fisheries are either exhausted or overfished. Um, you know, you can rattle off all sorts of statistics which kind of put us in a very depressing corner. Um, but it's, let's have a look at some of the kind of key causes. Landscape conversion from, uh, you know, just either in massive agricultural holdings where we're sort of putting huge landscapes under agriculture. Um, this is a palm oil plantation in Liberia where the country has put one and a half million hectares up to three companies only in Liberia for conversion of the uh, Upper Guinea uh, uh, rainforest into, into palm oil. And this is something that's going on at the moment. We know, we have seen figures of, of the kind of loss of forest and natural habitat um, through land conversion. There's also massive uh, impact just through infrastructure development, whether it's the carving up of landscapes, the development of roads and rails and power line networks, pipelines that are taking gas or oil out of the Amazon jungle. All of these things are causing impacts onto the way the ecosystems function and the integrity of those ecosystems and of course the loss of habitat and, and, and what that means to, to species. This is a photograph from Mongolia and I'll make some reference to that later. And then of course there's the, the extractive sector. This is a mine in the uh, high Andes, it's a 4,000 metre high mine which gives you some idea of the extent to which us human beings will go to actually extract a, a mineral. Uh, this is a copper mine owned by Anglo-American the mountain that you can see at the back is um, Aconcagua. It's the highest mountain in the Andes. And uh, this mine looks out over, it's on the border between Argentina and Chile. And it produces about 30% of, of the uh, income from the Anglo-American copper business unit. So it's an absolutely enormous hole in the ground. And it's essentially just taken, taking a mountain away. But the extractive sector is moving further and further into more and more uh, harsh environments. We have enormous challenges now because of, of um, the kind of the pressures that are coming in from humans and I'll mention a couple of these. So human population, this is the huge elephant in the room and you know as conservation organizations we're very reluctant to even mention the fact that there are close to you know, we tipped the seven billion uh, people in the <laughs> on earth and we're hurtling at a huge rate towards eight billion. This is a massive, massive problem because not only do people need infrastructure, we need to help uh, um, nations help bring their, their people out of poverty, um, but people need places to live, they need food to eat, they need water, they need energy, and all of this puts increasing pressure on the environment. So food security is one of those huge big issues. And that is partly linked to land conversion, but it's also hugely related to the quality of soils, the water provisioning, the all, all these other sort of ecosystem services that are founded in, in biodiversity. And of course, there's just basic human nature. We're inherently greedy, I think. And, uh, you know, human consumerism is what's driving a lot of the rest of it. Uh, I think there's probably... Um, a statistic that's been bandied around a lot but is actually a very real one is that we actually need if we are to kind of try and match what the US is doing we need two additional planets to uh, to provide the consumer uh, kind of greedy needs of of, of a developing uh, global population and uh, if, if countries like Brazil which are again moving rapidly towards this kind of similar state of development that the US is and China and, and India, um, we're going to need a lot more uh, stuff to, to, to feed, clothe, uh, provide energy for, et cetera, for these populations. And of course, that's not the answer. That's not sustainable development. And we have to get a lot smarter about how we do things. So those are some of the sort of rather depressing sides of what, I'm going to, what, I, what I wanted to share with you, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, and I've talked a bit about dependence um, and, and the fact that actually we really rely on, on natural, natural systems and the impacts um, and this whole concept that if we approach things through a risk and opportunity um, perspective, we're actually going to start to find better ways to think about uh, what we're doing to the environment and how we need to move forward. And this, these two words are absolutely fundamental when we start to look at how companies and governments start to think about the management of natural resources and their dependence 
on them and their impact on them. So this is really key just in terms of how we try as a conservation organisation to find the language that, needs to, that we need to speak to, to those in, in, in very powerful decision-making positions so that we're able to start to, to make sense to them on, on what we're trying to, to, to work towards. The other thing that is really important is, is this whole idea, which is, is familiar to use in, in the international development um, arena, around institutional frameworks and the legal frameworks that are necessary in order to um, draw these um, different parties together to actually find uh, a kind of sensible pathway through this massively challenging world um, to find um, you know, sustainable outcomes. This diagram, really, or this figure, is, is just about some of these emerging issues. And now all of the, this was done for BP um, last year. We did a, a, a review of how they, as a, as a global organization, are managing biodiversity and ecosystem services. And clearly, when Macondo happened in the Gulf, they realized they weren't doing so well um, and decided that they should uh, think very long and hard about what this means to them as a, as a business. I've clustered this into what could be the five capitals of sustainable development, but essentially each one of these factors, and you don't need to read them all, but it's just to cluster them into regulatory, ecological, socio-cultural, technological and economic issues. All of them have a foundation in biodiversity and ecosystem services. And we can see that technology, for example, is having to, to adapt very rapidly to the kinds of environments and the kinds of, of technical challenges that are being faced to extract more and more resources from the world. Uh, we're having to move into the Arctic. I hope we don't have to go to the Antarctic. I hope that treaty um, manages to survive the pressures of, of global consumerism. But um, you know, we're having to use unconventional technologies. We're looking at fracking. We're looking at uh, tar sands to gain our, our ga gas and oil. Um, we're, we're taking mountain tops off. We're, we're going into more and more extreme environments so that these challenges are essentially are not only where companies are having to go, but it's where organizations like mine and, and governments are having to start to contend with these, these pressures. But fundamentally, just to, to kind of bring all of those into to the, all those issues become materially valuable to companies and are materially valuable to nation states, to, to the governments, because biodiversity has essentially you know, a value uh, proposition. It has there are material aspects to the impacts that, that we're, we're having on, on, on biodiversity. Some of these big figures, like $6.6 .6 trillion, that's just uh, 10, 12 percent of uh, the global GDP, but that's the cost of environmental damage without even in starting to internalize what the uh, footprint is of and the value of the use, the use values of biodiversity and ecosystem services are. I think some of you may have heard of a, a company called Puma who make trainers and apparel, various sort of sporting apparel. Puma has internalized their costs and they did a valuation of this and it actually ended up being nearly the same as the company's worth. So they, the cost to the company of, of its impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services was more than, or well, almost more than the, than the value of the company. So they're starting to manage themselves a lot better. I've put here, it's an operational and sustainability issue, and of course that's true. Right, now back to this Hydra concept. Just wanted to pick, I picked seven, because you can see there are all sorts of pressures and impacts, but there are seven sort of kind of rather nasty-headed uh, issues that um, I've chosen to demonstrate really through a couple of case studies of some of the countries that, that I've been working in. Um, I think the one I, that comes up very often, certainly in the developing world where I've spent most of my time working, is corruption. And that's obviously related to human greed and some of the aspects that, that are um, a consumption and economic growth. But there are other very important ones really around governance, weak regulation, those of your institutional structures and your, your regulatory structures. Um, there's the hu rising human population um, and water security. And these are common uh, themes that, that, that kind of run through just in terms of that balance between 
the human need for, for structure and the human need for, for growth and, and development. But the other one which I think is really important is this resource curse. And the four countries that I've chosen will give you some sort of an idea of just how one can try and progress through this terrible uh, affliction, really, that has hammered a country like Nigeria, where uh, a country is very well endowed in, in natural resources, minerals, oil, gas, all that sort of thing. And essentially, they've been raped and pillaged by uh, foreign companies, by their own governments, um, and by you know, third parties, definitely, and certainly hasn't worked for the country to, to help to raise them out of poverty or to help to, to fund um, their sort of uh, social structures and, and, and their sustainable economic development. So these are massive problems. We've got, they're very unpredictable, they're in interconnected, um, and they're moving, they're shifting all the time. That's just a snapshot in any one, one issue, any un one moment that we try to attempt to have an intervention. Um, and I guess that's one of the things that we do as an NGO and, and that I do is, is we try to help to kind of create frameworks for interventions which either re reverse those trends or to try and find ways through some of these sticky predicaments. So the solutions really are, are that we, 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 you know, just in a list of five, it's really to try and get around those, those hydra heads um, and that is really around collaboration, partnership, being transparent, uh, being proactive and, and, and adaptive. And those are all very sort of nice kind of adjectives, I think they are. Um, <laughs> but they're all very difficult to do. And I'm going to take you now through these different stakeholders and, and um, take you first of all to Mozambique. I'm going to focus on the four key sectors because that's where, where most of my work um, happens is at the sort of nexus, the junction point of where all these different um, players have to work. So with businesses, we've got governments that have to be part of, part of the scene, of course. The finance sector, which I haven't mentioned yet, and I'm going to demonstrate what their use is, and of course where in NGOs are. So first of all, we've got Mozambique, and I'm going to take you to Namibia. Mongolia, and you can't see that underneath our logo, but that's uh, Peru. And if, in, in, if time kind of allows, I'm happy to skip any of them if, if we get to that point. So, Mozambique. Has anyone been to Mozambique? So we know that's brilliant. It's the most astonishing country. It has been through the most torrid history, and I think in, 19, in the mid-1990s it, it um, gained, in, uh, well, it, it uh, came through its civil war. Now, I'm South African and I lived as a, as a neighbour to Mozambique for most of my life, and I never visited it until earlier on this year, um, because it was just too dangerous. It was a frightening place to be because there was a huge, kind of these Frelimo and Renamo were fighting battles. Um, it was very, very... Uh, you know, uh, corrupt, it had, uh, you know, all sorts of fa you know, factions running and essentially plunged into the depths of, it became, I think, the second poorest country in the world. But it is endowed with enormous um, uh, wealth in terms of its natural resources and very recently they discovered some mega gas fields, sort of really world-class gas fields off the northern coast, just south of Tanzania, um, which are now being exploited by international companies. So it was a huge race by everybody, every, everybody who had access to a license, but particularly the really big companies. Now, these two pictures really depict the environment that sits on the coast right next to where these oil discoveries, these, sorry, the gas discoveries have been, been found. And key to this really is just to, just to give you a sense, this is a non-monetary economy. People are not poor here in the sense that you and I understand it. They have all the protein, all the kind of food they need. Their livelihoods are, are secure. They have fresh water. They have homes. And this picture on the left is where a massive LNG plant is going to be positioned. The world's second largest natural, uh, liquefied natural gas plant is going to be put on this site. This guy who's looking really chuffed because he's had a really good day's fishing, he's got his bow, he's just picked up some charcoal um, and he's about to, to paddle uh, across the bay to, to where his family lives. But the men here fish 
and the women farm, but the, he, he, he is now standing in what's going to become a, an enormous port development. That entire bay is going to disappear. And it's an extraordinarily difficult thing for a company to actually come in and understand, A, the context of what they're dealing with, but the dependencies that those people have on natural systems, on the, on the, on the fish fisheries, on, on the, the farming, on the, uh, you know, being able to go and hunt to get, get um, protein. But it's just extraordinary because this area has some of the best coral reefs in the world. Um, they have mangroves that are holding and, and stabilizing the, the, the coastline. Uh, you know, it's just extraordinary. That bottom part is kind of a little bit like what might, or what is going to happen to that bay. So companies are coming into this very aware that the global kind of eye is on them. And there's not only the big NGOs, as, as, as we heard earlier, but the NGOs take, take a number of forms and a number of stances, but there are a lot of very strong advocacy NGOs that are absolutely anti-development on this site. Um, we have protected areas that have been frozen and actually, you know, um, chucked out because of the threat that actually the government thinks that if they make this a protected area, they'll chase all these international um, companies away for, for, for foreign direct investment. But what we're trying to do is to try and figure out a way to work with the government who are actually pretty good. They've got one of the best constitutions in the world in terms of, of you know, provisioning for... Um, environmental law and they've got, you know, they want to expand their protected areas networks. Um, but they also want to develop, they want to raise their people out of poverty, they want to provide jobs for people. But there's some interesting tensions here. The company, which is any, and there's Anadarko, and then we've got Shell there, Petrobras, a whole lot of them, Statoil, all these really big global names in terms of oil and gas, the companies are like a afraid to actually enter the system because of the reputational impact, uh, damage to their companies. But they're looking for solutions and finding, trying to find a way that's going to provide them with some correct form of governance in a fairly governless uh, country to, to navigate through all these difficulties. Now that, si that picture I showed you of the community on, this, on the edge of the bay has about 7,000 people and they need to be moved. There's a whole resettlement requirement, and how do you start to, to do this? So one of the things we've been doing is to try and understand, you can see that's the west coast, uh, sorry, the east coast of, of Mozambique. You can see the big, uh, big rectangle is the um, concession where the gas is found. It's very, very deep. It's about over 2,000 meters deep. But they have to take all these pipelines onto shore and then process it and then have a port where they can ship it for export, the gas. We're taking a stance which is going to take us through the International Finance Corporation's uh, performance standards and company performance standards and uh, the oil industry's standards to actually try and achieve best practice. And we're going to teach the government how to do that. We're going to help build capacity within the government and within the local NGOs to try to, to actually take this forward themselves. So... Um, Really, that's what, what the company's having to do. They are arriving in a country which has, as I, as I mentioned, a post-conflict. It's, it's lacking in any government's governance. The, the legal frameworks are, are insecure and unsure. Um, but they need to, to find ways which are, is not only going to be recognised internationally, but also will help to, to provide them with a long-term security and sustainability within their, this country. Part of this might be a little bit of greenwash, um, and might be part of the, the reason why um, you know, co companies do this is just because it's the right thing to do. But most of all, it's about strategically placing themselves in a position which will allow them the social license to operate. That means the communities are not going to go and blockade their roads, but actually will help to improve their positioning and their success in this. The government has another kind of angle on it, of course. And they're a little bit afraid, well, they want as much foreign direct investment as, as possible. But we find in this situation the cronyism, the nepotism that has, has kind of come out of this uh, period of conflict has resulted in the need for these folk, uh, well, well, for the government to essentially have payoffs and paybacks. They're thanking their, their, their colleagues from the, you know, their generals in the war and have actually given this land to all their friends. So actually it's all a bit corrupt. And how do you sort of start to deal with that? 
Now we're trying to find the best way to do this, the best way to avoid and minimize impacts on this beautiful bay, but we find actually we cannot do that because the government's already made decisions on certain uh, things which should have been, um, certain alternatives which should have happened. Anyway, that's just to give you an idea of really some of, some of the issues that we, we're having to deal with and what we've come out with now, just from a conservation point of view and one that looks towards sustainable development, is a kind of program of activities that is a joint effort between those big multinational companies, the government, the NGOs, the local communities to try and find ways to answer the questions that we need answered in order to ensure that that development doesn't completely destroy the livelihoods of, the, of this country. So in terms of the, the threats to conservation, we have this resource curse that is actually th um, one of the biggest issues, but we're having to work around corruption, co uh, economic growth, poor governance and weak regulation. So that's just an example from Mozambique. Now Namibia, who's been to Namibia? It's the, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. I went there first about eight years ago and fell in love with it so much, I think I've been back 15 times since then. But this is a, an extraordinary place. Namibia has one of the most ancient, well, the most ancient desert in the world. It's 60 million years old, and as a result, has incredible endemism, enormous biodiversity. It's incredibly fragile, so any impacts that happen as a result of any development, whether it's or anybody just driving a track over the, de over the desert, will take millennia to recover. So it's that sensitive, and you can walk five kilometers and find new species. It's just unbelievable. Very, very, um, very, very fragile and, and amazing place. Now, the story I want to tell here is, is really around a kind of complete almost revelation that a government has had around um, just starting to understand their dependency on natural systems, their need to maintain sustainable approaches, and their need to recognize that there have to be multiple users in a landscape. And it starts off with those drilling rigs, essentially. About seven years ago, we were trundling through the desert, found those drilling rigs, and nobody locally knew what they were doing or what they were getting up to. So we started to answer some questions. Now, just a little bit of background again. This is country, again, after independence, created a new constitution, had fantastic laws, one of the best environmental management acts I've seen, certainly, but very, very hollowed out through the sort of structural adjustment processes of the, um, the World Bank, and I'm going to point a bad finger at the World Bank, but for, for that period in its history. But essentially, the government has no capacity to implement its own laws. So it's been relying for many years on development agencies and NGOs. So there's this uranium rush which has been happening. And it started off with those diggers, basically, in a national park. So this uranium mine site is in the Naum of Naukluft National Park. It's an extraordinary national park. Um, the previous one with the Velvicia Fluctor, that is also in a national park, and that was essentially pro uh, proclaimed as a World Heritage Site because it's the Lam, southernmost kind of vestige of this extraordinary Velvicia, which is a plant that uh, sits between the gymnosperms and the, and the flowering plants. But the country has, over the last two or three years, made it a policy decision to allow mining in protected areas, which is a really concerning kind of progress. Oh wait, hang on, I'll go back to this, because you know, can see what happens when you start mining in a protected area. That is a very big hole, and that's a Rio Tinto mine, it's called Rossing, it's been operated for 30 years, in, and it's bound on the edge. So on the north side, that dark patch is, is the Nam of Nalkluf National Park. And the company, because the government has allowed them to, has decided to move into the national park as part of their expansion program, which is really awful. Lots of lots of endemic species. And so because you know, companies will do what governments allow unless other people, other actors start to put pressure on them not to. Let's have a look at this picture because this map, it, it's, uh, you know, Namibia is much bigger. This is probably about one fifth of the country that you see here in an area called the Orongo province, which has beca become called the Uranium province. The green hashed areas are protected. Now, Namibia has 48% of its land mass under protection. Some under national parks, like these green ones, and uh, the rest of them are all through either private protected areas 
or through community conservation areas. So quite a phenomenal um, you know, statement or claim that they can make. However, all those coloured red and pink ones are mine licences. And that's just the uranium, which is the kind of nuclear power mine licences that are being given access to. So in fact, every single one of those mine licences is overlapping with a protected area, which is a big issue. Now, we've done a scenario plan here, looking at what was going to happen with those, the, the possible development of those um, mines in this, in this national park or protected areas over a, a period of, of eight years. And the scenario was to look at perhaps seven mines developing and just look at these figures. I'm not going to read them out, but you can just see the orders of magnitude in terms of you know, being in a hyper-arid region which doesn't have very much water, what the demands on water are going to be, what the demand for power is. Now, there's a mine in the very south of Namibia which, provide, which, which makes zinc. It's called scorpion zinc. And that uses, just that one mine uses 20% of Namibia's total uh, power production. They don't have power. They've been getting it from South Africa for 50 years. So huge power requirements and, of course, a massive influx of, a flux of people which adds to the whole issue of sustainable development. And most of this area is actually part of an ecotourism hotspot. It's one of the most amazing places and provides revenue and income for probably 50,000 people. And those mines, probably seven of them, would provide jobs for maybe 3,000 tops. So it's a very bit different thing. So this is a compromise. So what happened was we had to understand who the stakeholders were, what their dependencies were on, on the environment, who needed to be part of this picture of solution, and where, uh, where some of the answers might come from. So you can see here, you don't need to know all the details, but essentially it's about finding which ministries within the government needed to act on this, which power, utility, kind of water providers needed to, to be part of the answer, which mining companies needed to, and which, of course, driven by the NGOs, and this is something that certainly we, we, we were um, driving. And we came up, out of all that big picture, that big sort of institutional map, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with having to do that sort of thing, um, is to come up with an institutional framework which fed into policy development, which actually helped the government to tackle this and take ownership of it. And through this process, the Ministry of Mines and Energy, who were the big bad guy at the beginning, took ownership of the problem, commissioned a strategic environmental assessment, started to work with the Ministry of Environment and Tourism, and they commissioned a landscape level land use assessment, uh, which is something that we did uh, based on the biodiversity values and the ecosystem values. And they formed committees that were looking at best practice for the, for the companies. And everybody who had a mine license in the company now has to abide by those best practice principles. So where we were heading down a really terrible path of actually unsustainable development, we, so we have come up with a, a solution through this cross-sectoral engagement where companies are working with the government and with the, with the, the NGOs. So that's basically tackling all of those issues. The next story really is Mongolia, and I think uh, this is where Brian actually met me when I was talking about Mongolia. Um, Mongolia is a difficult place, and it's one of those countries which over the last three years has kind of suddenly emerged from you know, a backwater somewhere out there, China somewhere, you know, somewhere squashed in between Russia and China, a very interesting, very remote place. Um, and a place really filled with tradition and history and extraordinary landscapes. And it's one of those countries where you can drive for a week and not get to the end and not see a fence and not even see a road. But they found minerals, okay? And here you can see the, the Mongolia there um, in, in, in uh, just north of China and we've got Russia there. So it's landlocked and it was very underdeveloped. This is a picture of some of the traditions that you still see going on there. But the story here really is about a kind of naive government which really wants to do the right thing and started to think very long and hard about the entry of companies, foreign companies, into its country. Now, Mongolia has a huge history with China. They absolutely hate each other. And they have for more than 800 years, and they will probably continue to do. And that's just part of their their psyche, and it's just really interesting because every day there's some celebration going on in Mongolia about how long it was since they last beat 
uh, people south of the border. But anyway, in 2001, this gentleman, we call him Toxic Bob, his name is uh, Robert Friedman, uh, had a company called Ivanhoe. And Toxic Bob was known for Toxic Bob not only because of what he put into rivers and how he destroyed the environment, but I think some uh, thought he also put things into his own body. <laughs> I think he had a few run-ins with the drug lords or something, the drug uh, administration in, in, in the States. But anyway, he discovered this, and this piece of land here is what actually is the beginning of the end of this particular piece of Mongolia, because he found one of the richest porphyritic copper deposits in the world. And here we have probably a piece of uh, a geological kind of phenomenon which is going to allow 100 years of, of copper mining. So they started to do all the right things. They started to get a couple of, well, all the right uh, permissions from the government. And the government handed, they wrote a few short reports and got permission to start constructing this mine. And then the government suddenly thought, oh my word, what are we doing? This is an enormous mine. And they're starting to ask for water that's going to last. And there is no water there. There is no surface water except during flash floods. What are we going to do? So they decided and they negotiated. I mean, Rio Tinto had a small holding at that time. They negotiated with Rio Tinto, who has some of the best environmental policies in the world, to come into the country and help to bring this up to global best practice standards. So here's a story where a company is actually forcing another to actually raise its standards, but is also being invited by a government because it has the, doesn't have the wherewithal to do so, to come in and do the right thing. So Rio became a, a, a major stakeholder, and actually it was only last year in February they became the managing partner, so they actually had full control of how this uh, mine was going to develop. I was there about three years ago. This is what it looked like. They had 15,000 people on that site over a two and a half year period building this mine. It's absolutely enormous. They have to put in power and water infrastructure, all the components, and you know, you can imagine just the logistics of feeding that many people over that period of time. It's just absolutely astonishing. But of course, it's going to transform Mongolia. So they've already built all the roads. They've got roads diving down to um, to China to export. They're bringing power in from China right now. They've created massive bore fields to uh, abstract water from Cretaceous, essentially finite water resources um, to build this enormous mine. That's what it looked like about a year after they started and it's now complete and they produced first ore uh, this month. So it's absolutely one of the fastest developments in the world, but it's absolutely huge. So it is, it's, it's, it's a $12 billion project, one of the biggest, but of course um, it's transforming the country. Not only the people, because this is nomadic, nomadic peoples, it's carved up the landscape. And these are some of the species that were, were, were impacted. So when you put that much of a mine in the middle of nowhere and you're having to put power and water and, and, and roads and rails in, you're carving up a landscape which is actually you know, got species on it which can't cope with that kind of fragmentation. The Hubara bustard, which is the central one, can't stand, it can't breed when anything vertical is in its horizon. So, you know, gone, it just stops breeding. So how do you compensate for that? The, this creature is the hulan, it's the wild ass, it's one of the sort of ancestors of the horse, and it's, you know, it roams around the size of Denmark every year, and it can't cross roads. It just kind of doesn't know how to do it. And of course, when you've got trucks beetling down into China every 20 seconds, you can't cross because you'll get squashed. That, that's a problem too. And then the goited gazelle has a similar sort of lifestyle and also sort of roams around, but needs very specific environmental conditions. Now, Rio Tinto has a policy of a net positive impact on biodiversity. I mentioned it has some of the best policies in the world, and this is one of the key things that is driving its, its kind of work in, in this space. So when you're impacting species of this nature, who are very, very specific, but actually vast uh, in terms of its landscape, what do you do to try and achieve a net positive impact? So we've been working with um, the International Finance Corporation, who were going to put about $5 billion into this project, and Rio Tinto, to actually force 
um, a kind of license which was beyond what the government had given them in the first place. But this is a, a license, a compliance requirement based on the financing structures and the company policy, which is actually resulting in, in, a, in a global best practice outcome for, the, for the, the South Gobi. And what's happened is that we are having a biodiversity offset, very controversial um, um, kind of concept, a mechanism for conservation, but actually a very, very useful one in the right place. But we have a cons uh, uh, an outcome with a biodiversity offset which is 20,000 square kilometers because of the impacts on those species. So this just gives you an idea. We've got these two green areas are existing protected areas and in between is an important bird area which is related to those, um, those who bar robusteds. The orange bit is the uh, kind of corridor where all the infrastructure go it goes down to, to China, that's power and, and, and uh, road. The blue bit is that massive ball field, which is know, 650 square kilometers, and that's just a network of power lines because you need an enormous amount of power to draw water from you know, deep down in the earth. And so the footprint of the mine is having to expand into in terms, well, it's having to offset that footprint with this enormous amount of land that has to go under conservation. So we feel in some ways we've got a win there. So in spite of having this footprint, we've got 20,000 square kilometers of the South Gobi, which will be actively managed using local communities and ensuring their livelihoods, pasture, etc., to make sure that we get benefits. So these are some of the issues that we've been dealing with. I won't go into those. And my final story, if I've got time for that, is that okay? Everyone have it? So this is now, I'm going to take you to Peru. And I got back from Peru about a week ago, and it's just extraordinary because it's like going back in time to some extent. But this is a story about Anglo-American, and it's really different from the others because it's a case where people are driving the whole agenda around conservation and the protection of ecosystems and, and the services that they provide. So Peruvian economy is based on extractive industries predominantly. And of course, um, it, it too, like Mozambique, went through a very troubled time. And you know, the Sendero Luminoso being very active, it was essentially closed off to international um, you know, opportunities of, of tourism, for example, which it's absolutely full of because it's got such an incredibly rich culture, cultural heritage. But it's been a very difficult place to travel in. And whilst everybody, the international eyes, were sort of averted and kind of distracted by these, by the sort of political issues that were going on in the country, mines like this started to develop, and certainly oil and gas, and some of the biggest environmental disasters um, in the extractive sector ha have happened in Peru because nobody was keeping an eye on it. But recently, and I would say probably in the last three or four years, the voice of the people, of the communities, has become very loud and very, very powerful. And Peru, as I've put up here, has some of the best, or if not the best, indigenous people's rights law in, in, in the world, and they um, have large tracts of land which are respected and, and, and given over to, to traditional ways of life. There are uncontactable and uncontacted uh, peoples in the Amazon basin. And this is because the, the, the society has voice. And what's happened here, and I'm going to tell you the story around um, this Anglo-American mine called Keveco. They've been trying, they've had a mine uh, license option there for 15 years and have uh, decided to, it's a copper mine, and they've decided to start to progress with um, the development of this project. But they haven't been able to get their social license to operate. So they were given a license by the government, which now has some very good environmental law and e environmental impact assessment law and all sorts of things that would have required them to do a good job. But the community stood up and said, you cannot work in this area because we don't want you to make what we have up the road from you, another one of these disasters. They've poisoned our rivers, they've taken away our water resources, they've destroyed the trees that we have. They've changed the shape of the environment because this is a culturally um, significant thing for them. The spiritual value that, kind of, uh, that we get from, from as one of the ecosystem services. So the company thought very long and hard, and it actually has been working now with the World Bank and with these communities 
in tandem with the government to actually find a path through this, to actually make sure that actually the beneficiary is first and foremost the community within which the, um, they're operating. So one of the important things here, and you can see this, this green patch here is, the, is, is the wet, our wetlands. It's the wetlands of the, the upper Altiplano. This is at 4,800 metres. So I had a bit of a headache when I took this picture. And these are our vicuña, which are uh, native species there and, and are highly threatened too. So we've had a look at um, this. Now this, this, this operation spans almost an entire province and actually goes over into Arequipa. Those of you who know um, Peru um, will, will understand that actually the Altiplano is essentially from here up into this area. So this area is very high altitude and, and it's very mountainous. Uh, the mine is situated in, in a valley and it has a long um, kind of infrastructure corridor pipelines going down to a port. So it takes up, this has a very large footprint. Um, and what's, what we've got here is that it needs a lot of water and this is a hyper arid area. The water has to come from somewhere and they've done all sorts of calculations. They've got water coming from three river basins. So that's three water basins and this geyser. Now this is an extraordinary thing. This is a geyser field which is just spewing out water at about 40 degrees into this river and they'll be abstracting from this that comes from geothermal, it's geothermal, comes from underground sources. But what the community has required, they've had a look at the first mine design and they threw it back. They said, oh, we don't like the look of it. We don't like the shape of it. Your mine is in a fourth river basin and you actually, there's this pit here you can see actually goes in where the river used to be. So they're going to have to divert a river right round the pit and they have got, been asked to reshape entirely the whole sort of um, rock, uh, waste rock dumps, etc., to to essentially mimic what the environment looked like. This is what it looks like now. You can see these tracks. These are all the exploration tracks. And what the mine has been asked to do and has agreed to do is to reinstate the landscape so that it looks like that once they've finished in 30 years' time. The other thing they've committed to doing is going for a no net loss to biodiversity. And in order to do that, they've committed to protect over 50,000 hectares of land in the Altiplano, to protect those watersheds, to start and imp improve what is now a degraded habitat, actually, to improve that and get conservation gains. They've also got a lot of projects that are, are designed to, to support um, some of those species that are, are highly threatened in that area. But it just gives you an idea that you know, one little mine actually has a massive impact, massive repercussions. I mentioned four river systems. The fifth one is where uh, the tailings facility is going to be. So that's an enormous responsibility that the company has taken on and driven by communities and the social requirement to, to, to do this. So here we go. We've got NGOs and the business and the World Bank, who's helping to set mass these offsets, policies, etc., um, are driving companies to do a better thing. And we're getting uh, conservation gains out of that. We've got all sorts of, of projects. I'm not going to go through them all because we're, you know, in the interest of time. But, you know, I think this is a really good example of where, you know, companies and the government have been held to ransom, essentially, by local communities, and quite rightly so, because they're the ones who are dependent and they're the ones who are suffering, essentially, and who, who, who will be impacted predominantly by um, the activities of these third parties. And um, so what we should have is a mine that's very responsibly run and that will actually improve rather than degrade the environment. So these are a whole lot of these different uh, aspects that we are, are, are dealing with in this particular case study. So my final slide, really, is just to kind of show you some of the companies that we've been working with over the... Um, last couple of decades. Um, but you'll see they're not just companies here. And I've mentioned the, the World Bank and I've mentioned the International Finance Corporation. The, and the finance sector has become an increasingly strong voice, but also an increasingly strong, uh, um, I would say, governance point. They have set the bar. They are setting the standards for lending and, 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 and uh, where governance is lacking where laws are lacking, people are now deferring to the standards that the, 
the uh, lender banks are, are starting to demand from people, from the companies that they're lending to. And this is a really interesting um, turn of events because Peru has taken the IFC's performance standards as their reference. So th within their legislation, they now have performance standard six referred to when it comes to biodiversity. Liberia has just done the same thing, that basket case going on with palm oil. Um, and companies who are going into DRC or into Cameroon, where, where they don't just simply don't have the, the sophistication of, of the legal and governance frameworks are having to move that. So there's this really interesting play going on, I think, between the kind of the, the way the politics of works, where the societies are working, and the way companies are having to adapt, but are also pushing and sometimes being pulled by all these very different factors. Um, that's it, really, and I would like to take some questions if, if possible. I think this one was really about all hands on deck, and, uh, you know, we, it's, it's tough. There's never, a, there's never a, a kind of a common set of problems, and every, every context is very different. But thank you for your attention, anyway. I hope you've enjoyed this, the, uh, the photographs, if not. Has anyone got any questions? <laughs> Yes, of course. Thank you, Pippa. That was a. Uh, can you hear me at the back there? Yeah. Um, thanks, Pippa. That was a very interesting um, and articulate uh, uh, presentation. Very well delivered and very optimistic, um, which was a breath of fresh air, really. Um, so we've got um, 10 to 15 minutes of questions. Uh, so if you have questions, fire away, and we'll see where we get to. So we've got Emma, and then the man behind Emma, and then, yeah. Thank you. Shall I answer okay. that one? It's um, quite a long one, so I might yes, forget it um, if I go. <laughs> I think we've got a comment about greed no, and corruption, which mm. I think um, Emma was trying to put in anthropological yeah. context. Yeah, but maybe you just go to the. Maybe we can come back to that if we've got time. But should we go to the initial question? Yeah. 
if you can... Yeah, I think it's a very good point, and, and actually it's one of the things we're most concerned about in the first piece of work. I mean, this is very early, the, the, none of the construction has started. This is one of the very first uh, cases where these companies that are involved are actually allowing, if you could say the word, um, organizations like ours to get involved right at the design phase of, of any operation. Very often it's too far down the track and as we all, um, well I have a huge thing about environmental impact assessment processes because it's too far. Already the design's done, the impact's already on the drawing board and, and very often the, the, the thing's been, been built already, which is what happened in Mongolia. The, the people are, are, are need voice here and what the big concern is really that they weren't even told about these developments. They're very, very remote um, and so the, the first point would be to actually start working in a very participatory rural uh, appraisal type way but, but also to, to actually understand what the dependencies of, the, of, those, of those people are. Uh, we know that they, you know, are primarily dependent on the fisheries and that they actually are completely one with, with the, the natural resources in that area. So it's an enormous concern and, and I mean I have a, a I had a picture um, that I wanted to show you which just described, I mean there are probably 22,000 people around that bay that are going to be impacted by the change. It is it's an enormous issue and the government has not dealt with it properly. I think they were going to announce the project and the resettlement to the communities, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and this is the beginning. This is the very beginning, but they are fundamental because they are the primary. Uh, what would you call? They're, they're going to be impacted more than anybody. But when it comes to the, the sort of greed, I completely agree with you. It's very, very specific and very culturally sensitive as well. Um, the issue here has been. You know, there's all this kind of nepotism, but also a lot of favorite, um, pay, not payback, it's just essentially, um, you know, thanks going back to people who fought together in the war and carving up land, but very little uh, consideration has been given to the people who've been living there for multiple generations and whose livelihoods are going to, to be fundamentally altered. But also, who owns the land? Who's going to be part of the business deals? And there's some absolutely fascinating things I could send you to read on, on the the structures, the business structures behind the land ownership issues on, on in that area. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, second question. Hi, Philip. Um, also going back to your Mozambique case study, um, you said that the, the companies were quite scared or they were, they were scared of the negative uh, publicity that they would get by um, starting operations off the coast of Mozambique there. And I was wondering where that where that sort of pressure comes from? Is it coming more from the consumer side or is it coming more from the investor side? And how much in terms in real terms um, are these companies sort of suffering, uh, real terms, economic terms, from negative publicity? And on the contrary, how much do they benefit if, for example, like a, co a company like Rio Tinto, if they follow best practice, how much do they benefit economically from that? That's a very good question. The materiality of CSR or of corporate social responsibility or having made a commitment to a net positive impact. It's quite difficult, but I'll give you an idea. Um, Rio Tinto lost half a billion dollars out of its, uh, if, you know, when, when the Norwegian pension fund withdrew um, money from, from their investments. And that caused a, a dip, a dip. It recovered because people forget. Um, and that was based on, on, the, on the Grasberg mine in Indonesia, which has a huge um, legacy. So I think you can see you nodding. It's a, it's a terrible, uh, terrible mine. But anyway, that, so, so yes, there are materiality issues around reputation. Um, Macondo is a classic one with BP. BP and the, and the consequence, not only the legal costs, but actually the, the, the consequences of its impact to biodiversity, but the reputation has put it on the edge of, its, of survival, basically. If, if, if another accident happens, that company will go down. Um, so it's had a huge impact on some. In the Mozambique case, it's really been driven by a number of things. One would be uh, the, the results of Mokondo with BP have made the entire industry very sensitive to any um, scrutiny on their environmental performances. Um, social performance too, but with other reference cases, for example, Camasia project in Peru. Um, and 
so, so there are, there's the benchmark within their own sector, which they're worried about as well. So, you know, how they are, are rated against each other. They're, they're a very competitive industry, so they are looking at, at how they are ranked, and, and those exercises happen regularly within sort of rating agencies, etc. But increasingly, biodiversity, ecosystem services, social management are being included in the sort of socially responsible investment uh, ratings that, that, are, that the finance sector is doing, and these issues are coming more and more to the fore. Um, there is also pressure from international NGOs, so um, you know, more, more, more and more uh, companies are, are under that kind of scrutiny, and the, you know, if they don't do things right, they'll just be the power of the web and the power of media will, will put their names out there. And I think what I find really interesting is this shift. Companies are becoming more self-conscious, well, certainly the big ones who have a reputation to lose are becoming more self-conscious about um, how they are perceived to operate, particularly in countries which have uh, weak governance and weak law, because that's where it really counts. So if you can say, I'm doing it to performance standard, whatever it is, or the EBRD's perf uh, performance requirements, or to the World Bank, which has now adopted all of those requirements, then they've got something to stand up against. And it kind of, uh, you know, they, they'll find access to funding much easier and, and a whole lot of other things. But the social license to operate is now, I reckon, more, well, well, stronger than any of the others, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question about four rows up. Okay, um, then we have one in the middle here. So I was just wondering to know, because obviously these ISD performance standards, they're one for London banks or London projects that require financing. But my understanding is a lot of these London projects also are looking to use local financing. They're using a lot more equity-based, self equity-based um, funds. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and it's and it's. I think we've got what 79 equator banks now, and they talk about 70% of funding going in, you know, is, is with equator bank funding, but that is only into, um, you know, the Western world part, the Western sort of OECD um, sort of company uh, country funded projects. Um, it's an enormous haul, to be honest, and I think that's where the support to government and to, um, and, and to communities and local NGOs is so important. So the bias actually has to shift. Um, we work equally um, with, with, with local NGOs or national NGOs in, in helping them to, to contend with the sorts of developments that we've seen here. And yes, I've shown the big international companies who are, are more accessible are driven by their own policies as much as those of, of, of international um, sort of lender banks. But what's very interesting is that the World Bank has completely shifted its strategy in the last two or three years. And they their whole approach to sustainable development is founded in the, the I wouldn't say the value, I'm very reluctant to say value because everyone wants to put a dollar sign to it, but the fundamentals of understanding biodiversity and ecosystem services as a national asset and then um, helping uh, countries to develop the frameworks necessary to demand those sorts of standards across the board, and that's where bank, you know, lending comes from all court, all, all quarters. Um, we know that Shell doesn't need funding; it's, it funds its own projects. So does Rio Tinto, and this was a case. In fact, Rio Tinto, very interestingly, in Guinea, uh, decided to um, partner with the International Finance Corporation as part of this their uh, license to operate, and it was a global. Um, the global reputation uh, issue that they were trying to get around um, by going into a country which was absolutely distraught. It was a complete basket case because of the, the politics was all over the place, very, very insecure and very unstable. 
Um, so they you know, made declarations around and commitments to abide by those performance standards as part of the, uh, the acceptability of the project in the global um, arena. But you know, funding's gonna come from everywhere and the only way to do that is to work with other sectors, I think. Okay, we've got time for one more question. <coughs> Thank you. Um, when ISS and, and SSI learns about projects um, that, that are going to happen, for example, in Mozambique, you, you hear about this in the first place. How do you, as an organization, approach these? What are the first steps? Do you first approach the government or do you compensate the companies, the local communities? How do you get these projects started or your activities in motion? That's an interesting question. Um, We've, there, there are two ways that we work. One is through the strategic partnerships that we have with multinational corporations, just a handful of them. I've probably got six companies who we work closely with, and that um, has quite a large geographic spread. So in Mozambique, we've had a 10-year partnership with ENI, the Italian oil and gas company, um, and we have worked through that period of time to integrate biodiversity into all their management systems and the way they make decisions and how they actually approach projects. So we were lucky in this case because um, you know, Mozambique has been a priority uh, country for us. We've been there for 12 years now working in Nyasa, um, but this actually took us into a slightly different geography in Mozambique. And we were able through that relationship to start broaching, well, we already had relationships with the government, but we started to bring it in from a completely different perspective and started helping the government to recognize that here was a company that wanted to abide by industry best practice, but also wanted to apply all these other different standards. And I mentioned the IFC again on, this, on that project. In other countries, it's very, you know, it can be quite different. In, in Cam, uh, Cambodia, for example, we have a, a, part, a partnership. Our partner there is the government. So we are helping the, the Forestry Administration and the Environmental Protection Agency to actually develop the frameworks, which would then start to scrutinize what companies are doing. So we would help them with environmental impact assessment, reviews, um, you know, educating the, the, the student, all that sort of thing. In Liberia, the same sort of thing. The relationship we have there is with the government. <coughs> so we're able to you know, set up national interpretation groups for the palm oil sector, for example. And that, um, you know, and, and, and work with local NGOs, so at a community level, because that's absolutely fundamental. Um, so it varies from country to country. Um, but I, as I say, that the reason we've, we've got these partnerships with companies is not because, you know, they fund us. Yes, they do to a certain extent, but actually we, we leverage our, our, um, our relationship with them to enable us to do things in, in, in landscapes where it's actually quite difficult to make that first step. You know, it's like, how do you get your foot in the door? And that's, that's, a, good, that's a good way. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm gonna finish with, a f with several thank yous, actually, uh, before we break for refreshments. So firstly, thanks to Reese for a uh, stimulating introductory talk. And then, of course, thanks to Pippa for a really um, excellent talk around this controversial issue, I think. So thank you for that. Mm, Thanks to you all for coming and for listening. Uh, thanks to Mandy at the back there and Holly uh, here and David and Chris for their uh, logistical support in helping to get this um, event organised. Um, thanks also to Brian Maddox at the back and his team, I know Bruce was on the team, in um, helping to develop this event over the last six months, finding Pippa um, <laughs> as, as a great speaker. And um, yeah, well enjoy the refreshments and uh, hope to see you, some of you this afternoon. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's thank good. You. And, uh,